Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Amanda Coolidge. I am the interim executive director at uh, BC Campus, which is an organization that works with all of the post-secondary institutions across the province of British Columbia in Canada. And I'm also here as the chair Hi, good morning. I'm Annika Manny. I am a principal with Edbridge Partners. Um, we are a consulting firm that supports um, members, uh, institutions, higher education institutions, um, systems, membership organizations, other organizations working in the education space. Um, we ser currently serve as the program managers for the Doers at Three Initiative. Awesome. Next slide, please. So um, in keeping with um, a practice that I follow um, in particular, and I know many of you do as well, um, my land acknowledgement, um, I currently reside and work on the unceded territory of the Chianu uh, Beecher Bay First Nation. And I'll say a little bit more about that after Annika uh, mentions. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I currently reside and work on the unceded territory of the Wappinger, Muncie, Lenape, and the Scottakoak people, um, which is in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York. So one thing I always like to tell people a little bit about is that the Chianu um, First Nation is located on the shores of the Beecher Bay in southern Vancouver Island, which is this image you can see here, where they lived for millennia. And the Chianu translates um, from the Kalam language as the place of the big fish, which really indicates the sort of richness of the sea life that has sustained the Chianu uh, people and neighboring First Nations with food, shelter, medicine, and clothing. They're also known as the people of the salmon, um, which really reflects the marine environment uh, where their culture and history developed. Um, one thing I'd like to say too, is that I've been reflecting on the genocidal actions of our colonial ancestors at residential schools across what is now known as Canada. And to date, more than 10,000 indigenous children have been found in unmarked grave sites. Genocidal actions in Canada is not something of the past. It continues to this day from colonialism, oppression, lack of access to clean drinking water for indigenous peoples, old growth logging, and the inactions of our Canadian federal government. I'd also like to acknowledge that my ancestors were colonizers, settlers, and benefited from the colonial structures in place in the past and in place today. And I really seek change through continued ad advocacy of clean drinking water in our province, as well as through the education of indigenous peoples um, to my 10 year old son. I'm also committed to this work because of my work at BC campus and my commitment to education and in particular open education. Murray Sinclair was a former um, member of the Canadian Senate and a First Nations lawyer who served as chairman of the Indian Residential Schools Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. And he said that education got us into this mess and education will get us out of it. Thank you. Next slide. So um, one thing to do, and I know many of you may have done this practice before, but if you want to learn a little bit more about the land on which you reside on and the people um, who've been there for millennia, you can go to uh, native-land.ca and you put in sort of your current location and it helps identify. It's a really great practice of, of that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we're going to do a little bit of an intro activity here where I would love for you to put into the chat um, your answer to the questions I'm going to pose here. Okay, so I'm going to get you to move on to then like click it, um, Carrie, and then it'll like pop up. Got some animation in there, you know. All right, would you rather live somewhere tropical or somewhere cold? So just put your answer in the chat. Cold, tropical, tropical. Okay, next slide, please. Or next. Would you rather always be running late or always be running early? Yeah, I mean, me too, running. Oh, Amber, nice. <laughs> Next slide, please, or next click. 
Would you rather live in the mountains or at the beach? Yeah, we were just in Denver um, for an event and I have to say, I really missed the beach near me. Next, please. Okay, great. Thank you for that intro activity. I hope uh, you learned a little bit more about your colleagues. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Annika. Great, so I'm gonna talk to you just a little bit about what Doers is, um, its history and um, framing of why we created Doers and what the purpose is. So Doers stands for the Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success Collaborative. Uh, it's currently a group of 30 public higher education systems and statewide and province-wide organizations. Um, that number has grown over time. It started with three uh, statewide province-wide systems and now we're up to 30. Uh, and the goal is to really support student success um, through the use of open educational resources and practices. Uh, the organization or the collaborative was launched in 2018 uh, with the purpose of helping members implement, scale, and sustain OER. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about how it came to be. Um, in 2017, the University System of Maryland, the City University of New York, and the State University of New York all announced major expansions of their open educational uh, initiatives across their post-secondary institutions. And um, those initiatives were associated with funding from each of those states. Uh, the leaders of the initiatives in the statewide organizations uh, for OER across the three um, systems regularly got together just to discuss, you know, how are we doing this from our role um, within a university system? How are we guiding statewide OER initiatives? Um, what could we be doing better? How is what we're doing different from what an institutional level uh, leader has to do um, when we're working across systems and across states and provinces? And they came to realize that there was some unique aspects to that. There are some things that um, are different when you're trying to both scale and sustain something at such a large, um, at such a high level, um, that it would be valuable to connect with other members um, across the country who are trying to do similar things. Uh, so out of that, Doers was born. Um, it's a fully uh, volunteer organization at this point. Um, it's run uh, by a steering committee um, and a chair, who is Amanda, um, and supported by um, us at Edbridge um, in terms of just day-to-day -day project management of the organization. Um, and they really strive to uh, connect with each other and to not recreate the wheel and uh, to work together to strategize on how open education, and open, open educational resources and practices both uh, can improve student success through access, affordability, and achievement. Next slide. So the organization um, established uh, what we call our statement of purpose, and you can read about that on our website, which is um, doers3.org. Um, and on that statement of purpose, we say that our we Purpose is to position the organizations, our members, to realize the promise of high quality, accessible, and sustainable OER implementation to achieve equity and student success at scale. Um, so we're really about building the capacity of all of our members to scale, shape, and sustain their work in open education. Next slide. And um, to do that, we created a set of principles um, that guide the work and that all of our members agree to when they um, decide to become members of doers. So um, the first is that uh, we're all trying to develop clear system-wide, statewide, province-wide rationale for both adopting, scaling, and using open um, as a tool for equity and student success. We are trying to share our learning and tools and resources across the collaborative, again, trying not to recreate the wheel and, and to benefit from the experience of others who may have come before or have larger, more well-resourced um, operations around open. Um, of course, all of our states and provinces are wildly different in terms of their policy context, their political context, the amount of resourcing they have available. So trying to um, network, share, communicate, and learn from each other is really key. 
uh, we are endeavoring to collaborate in, in those kinds of cross-state province projects um, to advance a few goals around research, policy, accessibility, equity, and quality of open. Uh, we have committed to uh, requiring that any newly created um, uh, OER supported by OER designated public funds uh, remains open, openly licensed, easily discoverable, and fully accessible uh, to encourage that practice across our institutions and organizations um, that are part of our, our local networks. Um, and at the state and province level, making sure we're engaging with service providers, vendors, and others who support the open education field and the network and um, advocate with them to um, continuously improve their, their products and services and ensuring that those remain fully accessible, providing day one access, allowing students to retain content, um, doing all of the five R's of open um, and really using the advocacy power of statewide, system-wide, province-wide um, organizations to advocate with all of the folks that um, support the marketplace of open. Um, and then driving innovation within the open um, field and across higher education ecosystem um, by trying to uh, work together to identify gaps, coordinate the development of new content, ensure discoverability of content, helping to inform the development of platforms, analytics, tools, services, vendors, um, et cetera. And finally, just to, um, to advocate and inform institutional systems, state, province, and federal policy with respect to the use of implementation and open. So um, those are the kinds of things this network endeavors to do and to support its members in doing. Next slide. Okay, I think I'm turning this back to Amanda now, who's going to go into more detail about the various uh, projects that Doers has undertaken and will be undertaking in the next few months. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, the Doers uh, organization uh, in the last year was fortunate enough to receive uh, funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation in order to move forward um, with a lot of these projects, but also to work on what does sustainability of our organization look like. And I'll get a little bit more into that when we start having a bit of a conversation about what does a volunteer led organization mean. But in the meantime, we have three major projects that are happening, uh, three major working groups. So the first one is research. And the idea is that in order to better quantify the collective impact of OER, um, Doers 3 is working on a new research database. So we really hope that the tool will help researchers easily access a wide range of valuable OER data. A central repository of OER data should present new ideas regarding methods, frameworks, and approaches to instruction. So in addition, um, having more OER data could have reinforced work on other aspects of OER, such as equity and tenure and promotion. So the database will collect data on OER use, course outcomes, demographics, teaching and learning practices, and course name and number. This data um, would help cast a wider net in measuring the impact of OER because it accounts for socioeconomic data as well as the efforts of educators. And in addition, while the cost saving aspect of OER has been a central focus of much research, the database would aim to also help research researchers identify the positive impacts of OER on student learning and success. Um, so we're also developing a research agenda with data definitions to provide guidance on the type of data for which a collaborative is looking for. Um, Doers 3 will see contributions from um, many of the uh, institutions and system-wide offices as well as institutional research offices. So the second group we have is equity. Um, the overarching goal of the Doers 3 OER equity um, has been really about, um, sorry, one of the projects that's come out of this is the equity blueprint. And the idea there and the overarching goal of the equity blueprint really is to define, unpack, and explain the multiple uh, dimensions of equity um, and the foreground, the role of OER in closing those equity gaps. So the blueprint is <laughs> composed of three sections. The first is the overview, which is a theoretical framework and research foundation. 
Um, it says, you know, what is the OER equity blueprint? It provides visions, values, and definitions, and a research foundation. The second is the equity through OER rubric, which is a detailed guide and self-assessment tool to integrate equity and equity-mindedness into OER and mobilize OER to close those equity gaps. And lastly, there's the uh, there's been a really great set of case studies developed, Affordable Learning Georgia and Accessibility by Jeff Gallant, <clears throat> BC Campus, and Accessibility by uh, Josie Gray, who's been doing some phenomenal work in this area, and the Ohio State University's Racial Justice Grant Program to Increase Diverse Voices in Course Materials by Ashley Miller. <clears throat> there are some uh, grants coming out of this, but we're going to save that to the last so you all can hear. Uh, stay with us to the end. Um, the third group we have is called capacity building, and a critical part of sustaining OER in higher education is recognizing the contributions um, by instructors who create and improve them as part of their professional work. So this really, a lot of this work, you know, um, with the capacity building, we're talking exactly what this group um, this conference is about is the labor of open education. So in order to aid this effort, Doers has developed an adaptable advisory model to help guide faculty as they attempt to include OER work in their tenure and promotion portfolio. And the model is not exhaustive in any way, um, but it will be most useful for uh, as a way for faculty to start thinking about how best to fit their OER work into their local TNP guidelines, or as OER um, adapted, it can be adapted to those local concerns. And um, although the uh, document in its current form really does have individual faculty in mind, we do encourage TMP committees themselves to adapt and edit this document to use it as a guidance. Um, and we've also know that um, few institutions have recognized open educational practices as deliverables towards tenure and promotion. And um, faculty in documenting their OER work in their portfolio should characterize their work using terms to aid colleagues in understanding their contribution. So for each contribution, we've suggested whether the contribution could apply to those categories, um, either research tenure, uh, or sorry, research, teaching, or service. And we've marked multiple categories, which are most relevant, will depend upon your context. Um, the matrix also includes examples of how faculty might think strategically and where their open contributions would be valued most and how to best frame those contributions. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is a volunteer led organization and what I'm going to ask you to do and I'm going to share my screen for this one is I'd like you to go to menti.com and put it in here and use the code um, or you can use that link as well and you can use the code 8132427. Um, <clears throat> let's see, share my screen. I will stop your screen sharing and move to mine. Um, and um, wrong screen share, sorry, just a second. I'm using multiple screens here, which is always a good time. All right, here we go. So what, um, just making sure, can you see this? Yeah, great. So um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today as well, in particular about this um, is, are you a member of any type of volunteer led organization or, um, and this could be either within your current institution, or it could also be um, outside, like do you volunteer with your kids hockey team, do you volunteer on at the library. Um, what are some challenges that you have faced. Um, as a volunteer organization, or even thinking about what would be some volunteer, um, I'm sure many of you volunteer to be on committees if you're at an institution, things like that. So we're getting some good responses here. Coordination with leadership, volunteer management and decentralized structures that recognize contributions and encourage accountability. Time above all and bringing projects to completion, timing of meetings or opportunities. These are great. Committee membership not represented of particular yeah, population served. Let's 
just give you a couple more minutes if you have other things you want to add. Getting fellow volunteers to do their part, communication, thinking about divisions of labor, time, working across university, yeah. Time to implement and plan projects. Okay, awesome. I'm just gonna to move to the next question. So the next question is, has anything um, that you've witnessed, uh, what's worked to mitigate, mitigate those challenges? Anything in particular um, that has been beneficial? I'm gonna put a couple of my own things in here too. Flexibility and how folks can contribute, not just one way to show up and be part of the work. I love that. That's a really good um, note. Actually, teams or Zoom meetings have helped in a pinch. Setting up working groups, open conversations and flexibility, paying for people's time if possible, clear and frequent communication about how much the work is appreciated and what the benefits to the, yeah. I think that's a big one, right? Is like recognizing the um, contributions that are taking place. I really, I really believe in that too. One thing I didn't put down there, but I would say also is uh, transparency of communication. Smaller circles for execution, larger groups for setting vision and mission. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna keep going to the next one. Oh, that's it, okay. Those are really helpful. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if Carrie can bring us back to the slides. Oh, somebody wrote um, also calling folks in when there are issues instead of excluding out 100%. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So, I do have a few lessons learned from a volunteer led organization in terms of what I think has been um, really powerful. And uh, I, I've only been, I don't even know how long I've been chair of this organization, but, um, but what I've noticed, and I think what a lot of you have said is very similar to the challenges faced, but also how to mitigate those challenges. Um, one of the things I think that I didn't put on here is really a shared vision of purpose, which I think is really important in order to uh, create collective buy-in and interest. I think people choose to volunteer for something because of something they believe in and something that they see as a common purpose. And so one of the things um, that I we just met in Denver as a doers group, and one of the things um, that I think is really important is to bring people back together into a place, whether it's face-to-face -face or online or hybrid, to sort of recenter themselves in terms of what it is, is our common purpose? And are we meeting the needs of the groups that we're hoping to serve? And maybe the purpose shifts, you know, the opportunity to be flexible in that. Another thing too is to acknowledge, um, the biggest part for me has been acknowledging the contributions that everyone is doing this as a volunteer led um, initiative and to recognize and acknowledge the contributions of each person. And I loved what somebody said in mitigating those challenges, which is flexibility in how 
folks can contribute. There's just not one way to show up. And I think that's absolutely powerful. You don't have to just be a uh, committee chair, but perhaps you're reviewing call for proposals or you're doing an edit to something or even just providing ideas and being present in a meeting is huge. Clear communication and asks. Um, this is something that both Annika and I are very uh, committed to, which is ensuring that um, folks really understand sort of what's happening within the organization. And, and if there are asks to really be very clear about what those are. Uh, sharing and transparency as well. This is something that uh, we are really um, committed to and something we're hoping to change a little bit within our organization only because I think during the pandemic, we, um, we had a lot of initiatives going, but we also didn't necessarily come, um, there was a lot of siloed in the groups. And so it's really important one thing we noticed within the the convening this last cup this at the beginning of the week is that people are really passionate about sharing the work that's happening. They want to know what other groups are doing, and they want to be in the know. And also the transparency, um, opportunity to shape an organization. I think this is one of the key things about being part of a volunteer led organization, especially one in its early infancy stages. We've been in we've been as doers as four years four years now. But I do think that this is still a young organization and it's really exciting to be able to shape it, to be able to bring people together to think, what is the governance structure going to look like? What would a membership framework look like? So the opportunity to be a part of that conversation, I think is really cool and, and um, it's great. Next slide. Okay, so I did promise that I would talk about what is next and what's available. Um, so there's a couple of really exciting opportunities. So we're really excited to announce that there's a call for proposals seeking participants to pilot the equity through OER rubric. And Annika is gonna put in the link to this. This is with post-secondary education partners across the United States. Um, and through a grant provided by the Hewlett Foundation, funding is available in the form of six $10,000 block grants to participating post-secondary institutions, one grant of $18,000 available to post-secondary education uh, systems or SHEOs. So a total of seven projects will be funded. One thing to note is this is uh, only available to current doers, member, member states and organizations. So if you're not sure if your organization or state is a member of doers, feel free to reach out to Annika or I and we'll put our email addresses at the end there. So proposals are due Monday, October 24th. Um, we'll be announcing the recipients of these grants November 28th. There's a lot of information in the call for proposals and the interest application. And again, if you have any questions about it, just reach out to us. Another um, call, and this one is available to anybody, is we're trying to build on our previous work with the OER contributions matrix. And so we're seeking authors for a book length project centered around valuing open education work and tenure promotion and reappointment process. So to that end, we're interested in case studies written by faculty, staff, and administrators dealing, uh, detailing their experiences and trying to appropriately value OER and open educational work in that process. And so what we're trying to do is to ultimately be the first stop for anyone asking, how can I make open education work count toward job security of myself and others? So the idea is that we're hoping by collecting these case studies from those who have experience, we seek to have as many examples from as many type of institutions as possible so that looking for answers to these um, this problem, we can find solutions that speak to particular and very specific issues. So Doers 3 seeks abstracts of no more than 250 words for potential case studies by October 24th. Um, case study authors will be compensated for their work, um, and this will be peer reviewed. So uh, you will be, the authors will be paid a stipend of $1,000 Authors will receive half of that at the start of the project upon signing an MOU and the other half upon submission of the case study. Um, so there is a full call there and we'd be happy to answer any questions about that. Next slide, please. So finally, just to say, um, we would love to open this up for questions or comments. If you're interested in joining Do or Threes um, and are a representative of a system organization, please reach out to us. If you're not sure if you're a member of a system organization, reach out to us. 
And if you have questions about any of the calls, reach out to us. So I will leave it open to link uh, questions or comments. Thank you both. We do have uh, plenty of time for questions or comments, so I'll scroll back through the chat to see if there's anything. But um, if you'd like to post something in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, you should be able to do that and um, and share your question that way. I have really, really excellent Zoom wait time here. Learned a lot about just leaving space open over the pandemic. So I'm happy to keep holding on. And also, I should say, um, if you don't have any questions and you are or comments, um, please do reach out to us if something comes up later on. Um, we, I think, are very good at communication and getting back to people. Um, and if you do have questions specific um, to the UT system, I do know that Rebecca Karoff is um, one of our steering committee members and um, has a lot to say about participation in doers. So um, I'm sure Rebecca would welcome any questions you might have also. And so this kind of, this concludes our presentation. Um, if you want to um, sign off, you're welcome to. If you want to stick around to chat with us, you're welcome to do that too. Yes, and we will leave the room open. I'll stop the recording, but we'll leave the room open. So if conversation wants to continue, thank you all uh, for attending and enjoy the rest of the third day of the conference um, and enjoy your lunch break soon too. <laughs>